Welcome to Recap Lounge. Today, we will discuss the 1994 film called The Shawshank Redemption. There are spoilers ahead. In 1947, a Maine town financier, Andy Dufresne is convicted of killing his wife and her golf pro boyfriend. Since Maine does not have the capital penalty, he is sentenced to two consecutive life terms and transported to the infamously harsh Shawshank prison. Andy continues to assert his innocence, but his icy and manipulative behavior convinces everyone to suspect he committed the crime. Ellis Boyd Redding, often known as Red, is now being examined for parole after spending 20 years in Shawshank for murder. Red's parole is denied despite his best efforts and demeanor, which doesn't bother him too much. Red is then presented as a local smuggler who can provide prisoners with everything they reasonably want. A signal alerts all convicts to the entrance of fresh inmates. Red and his companions bet on which new inmate will have a mental breakdown on his first night. Red makes a large bet on Andy. During the first night, a freshly arrived, overweight inmate with the nickname Fat Ass, breaks down and screams hysterically, enabling Haywood to win the wager. The jubilation is cut short, however, as the top guard, Byron Hadley, brutally beats the overweight guy for refusing to remain silent when requested. Meanwhile, Andy maintains his stability and composure. The next morning, the prisoners find that Fat Ass died in the hospital while the jail doctor was absent. Andy inquires about the man's name, but Haywood dismisses him. Andy approaches Red a month later after hearing about his ability for discovering items. He requests Red to locate a rock hammer, which he believes is important for his passion of collecting and carving rocks. Andy dismisses Red's inquiries about his objectives with laughter. Red agrees to make the order and warns Andy about the sisters, a gang of convicts who sexually attack other prisoners, especially their leader Boggs, who has a thing for Andy. Red immediately loves Andy, despite the fact that other convicts believe him to be a pretty frigid fish. Red believes Andy would use the hammer to escape jail in the future, but when he sees the hammer's true size, he understands why Andy laughed and joins in the mirth, thinking it would take a man 20 years to dig his way out of prison, dismissing the notion that Andy may use the hammer to escape. Andy spends the most of the first two years of his captivity laboring in the prison laundry or battling Boggs and the sisters. Andy is routinely beaten and attacked, despite the fact that he resists and fights them each time. However, he never speaks out about it. When a work detail for tarring the roof of one of the prison's buildings is announced, Red pulls some connections to assign Andy and a couple of their common acquaintances to the assignment, providing everyone a respite from their normal routine. Andy overhears Hadley whining about having to pay taxes on a future inheritance while on the job. Andy informs Hadley, using his knowledge as a banker, how he may shield his money from the IRS by giving it to his wife as a one-time present. Then, he offers to help Hadley fill out the papers in exchange for some cool beers for his other prisoners while they are tarring. Hadley first threatens to toss Andy from the roof but later agrees to deliver cool beers to the working convicts before the task is completed. Red states that Andy may have used the situation to earn a few favors with the officers, but also believes Andy did it to feel what life was like before prison. While watching a film, Andy approaches Red with an unexpected request for Rita Hayworth. Red is shocked by the request but agrees to fulfill it. Andy sees the sisters again as he departs the theater. Although he is able to argue his way out of being violated, he is beaten within an inch of his life and spends a month in the infirmary. Boggs spends a week in the hole for the assault. When he exits his cell, he finds Hadley and his men waiting for him. He is left paralyzed for the remainder of his life and is moved to a prison hospital. The sisters go on and never again trouble Andy. Andy's cell has a collection of pebbles for him to sculpt and a large image of a actor Rita, both of which are gifts from Red and his pals. Warden Samuel Norton learns about Andy's assistance to Hadley and conducts a surprise cell check to evaluate Andy. While the guards are searching the cell for contraband, he discovers Andy reading the Bible and they discuss their favorite passages as they flip the cell upside down. The warden, pleased with their conversation, departs and nearly forgets to return Andy's Bible. Then, urges Andy to continue reading the Bible, stating, salvation lies inside. Andy is then informed that he will now work with Brooks Hatlin, an elderly convict, at the prison library. The reason for his relocation becomes clear when a jail officer requests Andy's financial advice. Andy sets up a makeshift desk and begins offering financial advice and assistance with tax returns to the majority of jail guards. Andy sees a chance to enhance the jail library, he begins by requesting funding from the main state senate. He writes weekly letters. Andy's financial support practice is so well regarded that guards from neighboring jails seek his advice when they come for interprison baseball games. Even the warden has Andy do his tax returns for him. In an effort to escape parole, Brooks cracks and threatens to murder Haywood shortly afterwards. Andy is capable of dissuading him. Red sympathizes with Brooks, who has plainly been institutionalized after spending 50 years at Shawshank, as his pals criticize his conduct. He has gotten conditioned to spend the rest of his life as a prisoner and is unable to come to terms with the outside world. Red remarks, these walls are tricky. First you despise them, then you adjust to them. After sufficient time, you get dependent on them. Brooks is granted parole and moves into a halfway house. In addition, he is given a job in a grocery store, which he detests. Eventually, unable to adapt to life outside of jail, he commits suicide, leaving the inscription, Brooks was here, etched into a wooden beam. Andy gets $200 from the state, some books and recordings, it took him six years of letters. Andy remains unfazed and redoubles his efforts, despite the state senate's belief that this would convince him to cease his letter-writing campaign. 
Andy discovers a copy of Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro among the donated documents when the ancient books and records arrive in the warden's office. He locks the guard assigned to the warden's office in the restroom and plays the record over the for the entire prison to hear. The song rapidly captivates the whole jail. Red observes that, if only for a minute, the words of these women made everyone feel liberated. Norton is enraged by Andy's act of disobedience and instructs him to switch off the record player. Andy reacts by increasing the volume. The warden tells the officer to break down the door, and Andy is sent to the hole for two weeks. When he comes out, he tells his companions that the stretch was the easiest time he's ever spent in the hole since he spent it listening to Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro. When the other inmates warn him that it's improbable, he discusses the power of hope in jail and how it may sustain them. Red vehemently disagrees with Andy, asserting that hope is hazardous in a place like Shawshank and advises Andy to get accustomed to living without it. Andy hints that Brooks did that, forcing Red to leave. Soon later, Red undergoes a second parole hearing and finds that he has been incarcerated for 30 years. He says the same phrases as he did 10 years ago, but without any excitement. His parole is denied once again. Andy presents Red a harmonica to remember his 30 years, and Red responds by giving Andy a Marilyn Monroe poster to mark his 10 years. About four years after the Mozart incident, the state senate concludes that they cannot just pay Andy off with another check. So they give him a $500 annual budget to construct his library. Andy strikes partnerships with book clubs and charitable organizations to construct the greatest jail library in the state, which he names after Brooks. Andy starts mentoring convicts who want to get their high school degrees in order to obtain a respectable career upon release. Meanwhile, Warden Norton capitalizes on Andy's expertise and devises a plan to put convicts to work on public projects that he wins by outbidding other contractors, prisoners are cheap labor. Occasionally, he permits other contractors to win contracts if the bribe is sufficient. Andy launders the money by opening a number of bank accounts and making a number of investments under the fictitious name of Randall Stevens, a guy constructed by Andy utilizing his knowledge of the system and mail-order documents. Officially, Randall Stevens possesses a birth certificate, a social security number, and a driver's license. Should someone ever examine the plot, they will pursue a fictional character. Andy explains to Red that he had to be jailed to commit crimes. Tommy, a teenage prisoner sentenced to Shawshank for burglary, arrives there in 1965. Andy and Red are friends with Tommy because he is charming and likable among his convicts. When Tommy confesses that he has been in and out of jail since he was 13 years old, Andy proposes that he seek a career other than thievery since he is not particularly skilled at it. Tommy begs Andy for assistance in obtaining his high school diploma after the proposal has a profound effect on him. Even though Tommy is an excellent student, he nonetheless crumples the test and throws it in the garbage after completing it. Andy collects it and submits it nonetheless. Tommy inquires about Andy's predicament, to which Red responds with an explanation. After hearing the story of how he landed up in prison, Tommy becomes obviously distressed. He then tells Andy and Red about a previous cellmate of his from another jail who bragged of murdering a professional golfer and his sweetheart at the country club where he worked, and the husband of the woman, a hotshot banker was incarcerated for these murders. Andy, hopeful in light of this new knowledge, meets with the warden, anticipating Norton to assist him in obtaining a fresh trial with Tommy as a witness. Norton's response is diametrically opposed to what Andy had hoped for. The warden grows enraged and sentences Andy to a month in solitary confinement when Andy insists he will never expose the money laundering tactics he devised for Norton over the years. The convicts debate the punishment, noting that it is the longest term they have ever heard of in solitary confinement. In addition, they understand that Andy may in fact be innocent and has spent almost 20 years in jail for a crime he did not commit. Tommy gets a letter stating that he passed and is now in possession of a high school equivalency. A guard delivers the news to Andy in his solitary confinement, which causes him to grin somewhat. Tommy is later led outdoors at night for a secret discussion with the warden. Warden Norton inquires if the account he told Andy is accurate and whether he is ready to testify on Andy's behalf. Tommy agrees wholeheartedly. The warden grins at him before signaling to Hadley to execute him with a gunshot. When the warden visits Andy in solitary confinement, he explains that Tommy attempted to escape and Hadley was forced to shoot him. Andy does not believe this tale and informs Norton that everything ends and he will no longer work for him. If Andy stops working for him, the warden threatens to close the library, burn all the books, and relocate Andy to a separate cell in a different section of the jail with the most severe offenders. He then departs and orders Andy to spend another month in isolation to reflect on the situation. Andy and Red have a chat in which Andy discusses his wife and how much he loved her, as well as how he feels guilty for her death despite not having fired the gun. He then discusses his plans for after his release from jail. He discusses Zahuataneo, a beach in Mexico, where he would want to spend the rest of his life and operate a hotel. He then asks Red if he would want to join him, to which Red replies no, believing that he is too far gone like Brooks. He then blames Andy for allowing Hope to manipulate his mind in such a way, stating that it would only lead to his demise. Andy accepts and is ready to go when he inquires of Red whether he is familiar with the Buxton, Maine region. Then, he describes a huge oak tree at the end of a wall. He then wants Red to pledge that, if he is ever set free, he would hunt out the oak tree and recover something concealed amid the stones, but he refuses to specify what it is. However, he is worried about his friend's mental state considering what happened to Brooks. When he discovers that Andy requested a rope from Haywood, he's more worried. Red feels Andy has reached his breaking point and is on the verge of committing suicide. 
Before sleeping, Norton requests that Andy polish his shoes and dry clean his suit. The guards turn off the light as Andy goes to his cell. Red states that it was his longest night ever. There was no answer from Andy the morning and is not waiting in front of his cell. The guard screams at Andy for being late and then proceeds to Andy's cell, expecting to find him gravely ill or dead. Norton feels startled when he discovers Andy's shoes in his shoebox rather than his own. The alert then sounds to report a missing prisoner. Norton goes to Andy's vacant cell and demands answers. Hadley invites Red in, but Red claims he is unaware of Andy's intentions. Norton, becoming more furious and paranoid, begins tossing Andy's crafted pebbles across the cage. The rock smashes through the wall where Andy's picture of Raquel Welch, in the area formerly held by Marilyn Monroe and Rita Hayworth. Norton rips the poster off the wall, exposing a narrow tunnel that Andy had dug. In a series of flashback scenes recounted by Red, it is revealed that many years ago, just after obtaining his rock hammer, he thought to himself, it would take a man 20 years to dig his way out of prison, yet he did it in just 18. Years Andy naively attempted to carve his name into his cell wall when a piece of it broke off. Andy, an enthusiast of geology, recognized that the wall's substance would allow him to drill a hole if he wanted to escape. Andy first purchased the large Rita Hayworth picture to conceal the hole. He spent years working on it at night with his rock hammer and dumping the dirt during his morning stroll in the yard. Andy made the decision to leave after Tommy's death. Andy carried Norton's clothing beneath his own to his cell during the previous night's storm, scoring a fortunate break when no one, even Red, saw Norton's sparkling black shoes on his feet. Many of his valuables, some documents, and Norton's clothing were placed in a plastic bag, which he attached to himself with the rope he had requested, and he fled through his hole. The tunnel he dug led him to a spot between two jail walls, where he discovered the main sewage line. Using a boulder, he struck the sewage line in time with numerous lightning hits, finally breaking it apart. Andy crawled through 500 yards of raw sewage in the conduit before emerging in a stream outside the walls. Later, a search team discovered his jail garb, a bar of soap, and a very weathered rock hammer. Andy goes to the bank in Portland, where he had deposited Norton's money, as the warden uncover Andy's escape. Using a false name as Randall Stevens and the required paperwork, he cancels the account and leaves with a cashier's check. Before he goes, he requests that they ship a package. He proceeds to visit about a dozen additional local banks, ultimately accumulating over $370,000. Along with Andy's written admissions and testimony, the box includes Warden Norton's accounting records and is sent directly to the Portland News. Following this, the Maine State Police and many media reporters storm Shawshank Prison to cover the emerging story. Hadley is arrested for Tommy's murder and put into custody by state police. According to Red, he heard unsubstantiated claims that Hadley began sobbing like a young child in the back seat of the police vehicle when he was being arrested. Since Andy disappeared, Norton hasn't looked into his safe yet, and when he does, he discovers Andy's Bible along with a note, salvation did lie within. Norton then turns the book to Exodus and discovers that every page has been hacked out in the form of Andy's sledgehammer. As the cops pound on his door, Norton returns to his desk, pulls out a little pistol, and commits himself by shooting himself in the head. Red ponders if the warden considered before squeezing the shot, how Andy might ever have gotten the better of him. Shortly afterwards, Red gets an unwritten postcard from Fort Hancock, Texas. Red interprets this as evidence that Andy escaped to Mexico. Red and his friends pass the time, with embellishments, by discussing Andy's escapades, but Red sinks into a type of melancholy due to his friend's absence. In 1967, during Red's third parole hearing, he tells the parole board that rehabilitated is a made-up term that was created to justify their work. He then reveals how much he regrets his previous acts, not because he is incarcerated but because he understands how bad they were. He concludes by stating that he must endure this for the remainder of his life and requesting that the board stop wasting his time and leave him alone. Finally, his parole is granted. He lives and works in the same locations as Brooks, even seeing Brooks' statement etched into a wooden beam. He routinely passes a pawn shop with many firearms displayed in the window. Sometimes he considers attempting to return to jail, where he has spent the most of his adult life, since he feels he has no life living as a free man, but he recalls what he promised Andy and purchased a compass instead. Red follows Andy's directions and hitchhikes to Buxton, where he discovers the stone wall Andy mentioned. There is, as Andy said, a massive black stone. Underneath is a little box holding some money and instructions to meet him in Zawadaneo, but he does not specify the location. In addition, he states that he wants someone who can get goods for a project of his. Red realizes all of the strength of optimism and is energized by his own emotions. After carving a fresh message into the wooden beam that says Brooks was here, so was Red, Red breaks his parole and flees the halfway home, unconcerned, since no one is expected to conduct a massive search for an old goat like him. Red takes a bus to Mexico. As Andy had hoped, the two buddies are ultimately reunited on a beach along the Pacific coast, as the movie ends. We appreciate your watching. Please like and subscribe for more videos.